can give us a little view of how it's impacted life insurers as, as mainly the people on this panel are focused on non-life. Yes, and if I may, not only that, but coming from Greece, from a country that is smaller, a market that is smaller, albeit it has performed as a country, fortunately, better in the COVID uh, disaster. Um, it's an interesting um, thing here that despite the uncertainty, and I certainly echo what my colleagues mentioned before, uncertainty is, is the biggest issue right now. But in Greece, where insurance penetration is lower than the European average, um, we have two differentiating factors. No big claims, so no business interrupt interruption issues like uh, were in other markets because simply most um, clients were not really insured or most um, businesses were not insured for business interruption, for example, hotels. Um, and uh, as a result of that, increased awareness about the need for insurance. So within this critical environment, uh, and mind you, the recession, I think we have yet to feel it. I think we're going to feel it much more in the coming months and maybe next year. But within this disaster, we uh, are taking the opportunity to push the, the, the insurance awareness, and we are seeing increased awareness on the retail level and increased demand for health insurance, which is also interesting because, albeit the state is taking care of COVID and is taking care of COVID pretty well in Greece, but people realize that they better have some some pretty solid health insurance. So within the disaster, we see some opportunity. Well, so the question was, uh, what do you think is the biggest challenge non-life insurers face in the post-COVID recessionary environment? It was 18% low interest rates, 24% decrease in available insurance spend from their clients, 12% um, strategic capital management, 18% uh, managing solvency, and 29% was claims inflation. So fairly evenly split across there, which I guess reflects the sort of broad spectrum of challenges that the industry is facing. Um, coming back onto these um, capital optimization tools, I mean, how proactive are companies in seeking this out? And perhaps are they more so now than they were before? I mean, Alex, I don't know if you can give us sure. a view from yeah. where you're sitting. So from a perspective of a CEO of an insurance group that, uh, that is active both in life and non-life, um, the world is interesting. So on, on your P&L, you have a demand shock on your top line. Uh, your balance sheet is, is um, at least investment-wise, is okay, but, but we don't know. Um, you have, uh, on the other side, solvency requirements. And mind you, there's a so first of all, I have to be clear, Solvency on the whole, I think, is very good for the industry with, with various asterisks. But there is a solvency to revision coming up. And especially for life insurance significant, um, you have IFRS 17 with onerous products, et cetera, et cetera. So you have these, these uh, two sides. In the middle, you have the shareholder who is expecting a return on his money or he's going to go elsewhere. And, um, and also, as CEO, in the middle, you have a world that is changing. The operating model is changing. You've got to become more digital faster if you haven't already done so. Um, you have any old sins, uh, high guarantee rates, et cetera, et cetera, in this kind of low for long environment, especially with IFRS 17 coming, are very onerous. So all of these balls are floating in the air right now. And so I don't know that there would be a CEO right now who would not be seeking uh, capital optimization solutions, particularly releasing or creating capital headroom on the solvency side. So if you manage everything else well, you can pay hopefully some dividend to your shareholder. There is a big elephant in the room, though. All these solutions that, you know, are market dependent and, and to an extent interest rate dependent, et cetera, et cetera. There is IFRS cost to create solvency capital space. And so this is what both, both sides of the market have to worry about and manage. I've got a couple of questions coming through. So I'm just going to bring in one of those now. And actually, um, 
this has been mentioned already in, in, in a way. Uh, this person says, uh, continental Europe has always been more shy of initiating runoff deals. Do you think the current environment will change this mentality among continental European carriers? Uh, perhaps, Alex, I'll, I'll start with you and I'll take it to someone else afterwards. I think if, uh, if your numbers um, can, um, can justify you sitting uh, pretty and doing nothing, then maybe we'll do nothing. But I think the environment that I just described before is forcing everybody to think about it. Then, you know, whether it works out and how it works out becomes a very complex issue of many things. Many things and the solutions provided and the cost thereof. But the, my feeling is that there's going to be more activity. You got anything to add on where you think all this new... Sure, I, 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 I think... I think, I think I've been covered, but I, what I hear and what I see from larger groups in smaller countries is basically focus. A companies, uh, smaller subsidiaries need to justify their existence or they are sold. That is one aspect. Uh, the other aspect that was mentioned before is we are all looking at new products, um, cyber, et cetera, et cetera. But new products need expertise, need capital, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, we should not forget that all these trillions of, of fiscal and monetary stimulus, the minute the uncertainty is lifted, uh, the uncertainty around COVID, and while this might happen with a, a vaccine or, or what have you, and when, nobody knows, but the minute it's lifted, we may be left with massive stimulus that is going to fuel uh, growth and, and maybe inflation as well at some point. So we have to also prepare for that world.